Amen. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings 17. We had a good day this morning. Even though with the time change, some people didn't wake up in time, we still had a good day. We had someone trust Christ this morning and uh, made the decision to follow Him. So anytime, no matter we had uh, lower attendance than average or um, a record-breaking day, doesn't matter. If somebody comes to Christ, that's a good day. Amen. And uh, so we had somebody trust Christ this morning, um, which I would say that if you can follow after today's sermon and not be like, I need to come to Christ, that would be very, very difficult if you needed to. So we're thankful that, that we were able to see someone trust Christ this morning, make that decision to follow him. They ended up waiting a little while after the service so instead of raising their hand, which they raise their hand every single week, so instead of raising their hand and not moving forward after the service, they just came forward. So they're able to follow the Lord and, uh, and trust Him this morning. Um, real quick, with this, we have tonight, next week, and the week after. So the next, uh, after today, just two more Sunday nights. So a lot of what we do, the prayer request and the missionary update letters, that's going to be moved to Wednesday. Um, so we're going to really put an emphasis on our Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. The teenagers are going to be starting a youth hour on Wednesday night, so that uh, the teenagers will all be on property on Wednesday nights. Um, in the coming months, we're planning on starting after summer, we're planning on starting a children's program on Wednesday nights also, um, so then the children can learn Bible verses. And the program we're, gonna, we're looking at using is one we used in Kentucky, and the reason we, I picked that one was because it was, it, the emphasis was less on, hey, here's a verse to memorize. It was less on, here's what to know, but why, why, why do we believe it? You know, so we, I, by the time we were finishing, we had four-year-olds going to their parents and explaining the Trinity to their parents. So we're going to be doing that here. So we're, that's the plan. And then they, they memorize verses. They'll win awards and get patches for their little sash they'll have and things like that. So we're talking to some parents and making sure that they're willing to commit to bringing their children. So we're really going to put a major emphasis on our Wednesday night Bible study. So if you do not go to that, I'd encourage you, once we stop Sunday nights, don't stop coming to an additional service. Come to, come to Wednesday nights. And um, now we have a good time in our Bible studies uh, on Wednesday nights. We really, we've been in 1 Corinthians for like 43 weeks, and we're and, and you might think that that's a long time, but I mean, we dug really deep into our, to our topic on Wednesday, that so much the fact that even Brother Chris is still talking about it several days later. So I, I'd, I'd like for you guys, when Sunday nights are over, if you do not come to Wednesday, come to Wednesday, uh, especially with we're adding children's programs and teen hour and different things like that. Um, that's going to provide more ample fellowship time for us. Um, but until then... We're going to be, I'm going to finish off this series next week. Eric's going to be teaching. But tonight, we are in 1 Kings 17. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings 17. You know, God always works graciously with people who trust and obey Him. And grace is not just for Bible characters. Sometimes we just, we read about these stories in Scripture and we're like, oh, that can never be me. It, it, grace isn't just for Bible characters and those around you. It, if you are God's child, grace is for you. And the story in 1 Kings 17 is a story of God judging people for turning away from him. So that passage may seem like a strange place to find grace, but even in his portrayal of judgment, God paints this picture of his grace. It's a reminder of his care. It's a reminder of his provision for every single one of us. Because the people of Israel turned to Baal. Um, God's prophet Elijah proclaimed that hey, God told him that a drought was going to come. And this was a fitting judgment. People had considered Baal the, the god of nature uh, that would change the weather. So that was his fitting um, judgment. And God promised during this drought that he was going to take care of Elijah. And he sent Elijah away. So first, God sent Elijah to a brook called Cherith, where he could drink from that stream, and he could be nourished from the food that was brought by the ravens. And then when the brook dried up, God told Elijah to go to Zarephath. 
and a woman, a widowed woman was going to be there and to take care of him. So obeying the, the commandments that God gave him took faith on Elijah's part. But it also, also about how God used Elijah in this, as an instrument in the, for, of grace in this widow's life. We typically you know, look at, at, at this and say God provided for Elijah, but God was providing for this widow. And you know, while we look at this first, we're going to look at the widow's burden and then her faith and then finally the blessings that God showed her to help in, with his grace, we're going to see all three of those things. Let's look at verse number 9 of 1 Kings 17. It says, Arise, get thee the, to Zarephath, which belongeth to, to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there at the, at the gate gathering sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little vessel, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in, in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil and a cruise, and behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Okay, let's pray real quick. Lord, I pray that you help us tonight to understand this topic that we're discussing of this, this relieving grace that you bestow on us. Lord, I'm so grateful that when we face trials and difficulties, your grace relieves us of what we're facing at that time and the burdens that we have. And God, I pray that you help us to live our life and, and understanding the grace that you bestow on our life just as you did on this widow woman. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So here in this passage, we see, for, well, first of all, in Bible times, it was really, really difficult for a widow woman to provide for her children. Now, we can see it being very difficult today. It was much more difficult during biblical times uh, to provide for their children. They, and the problem only compounded with the drought that lasted years. So number one in this passage, we're seeing the burden of, a, of the widow. There was a burden in this widow. The fact that the Bible tells us that she said, that, like, this is her last meal. And not only was it her last meal, but she, Elijah asked for water and she obviously said, okay. She began walking back to get it. And while she was still walking away and shouting this, he said, hey, also get me something to eat as well. And then that's when she turned around and said, uh, I don't have anything. You're lucky I have water in this drought. We don't know how much water she had. But what was the burden of this widow? There was much more than just, I don't have any food. And the Bible tells us that as she was down to her last meal when Elijah came to her house, and it, Anyone who's ever built a fire, how many sticks did she say she had? Two. Anyone who's ever built a fire knows taking two sticks, you're not building a big fire. You're not planning on something big. She was preparing to die. But in this, even in her perspective, God had other plans, and it was plans to manifest his amazing grace. And just as, just as he has grace to relieve every burden that she faced, he also has grace to relieve every burden that we face. You know, often we look at this passage and we use this as a story of giving, of stewardship. But really, not only is it about giving, but this is, this is grace here. The fact is that God cares about our needs. He cares about the troubles and the burdens that we have. Psalms 146, 9, it says, The Lord preserveth the strangers and relieveth the fatherless and widow." but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. So what, was the, what were the burdens of this widow woman? Well, first of all, I would say that her first burden was loneliness. You know, we don't typically think about that burden that she carried. We don't know how long she's been a widow. We don't know when her husband had died, but we know that she only had her and her son to care for. She no longer had the companionship and the comfort that she felt that her husband had provided her. She was alone and she felt alone. She struggled to survive, shouldering the responsibilities that had been her husband now, trying to take care of her child. The, and also the word Zarephath means a melting place. So for this widow, it was a place where her heart had indeed been melting. 
and sorrow and loneliness, and she had suffered loss of her husband. And then when Elijah arrived, she was preparing for even more devastation. She was desperately in need of God's grace and provision. You know, there's times in our life that, you know, we may lose someone that we love that's close to us and we feel lonely. Not only is this loneliness, but there was also limited resources. The drought that, that the, the drought had used up all this widow had left. That I'm, I'm alone, I have my child, I'm trying to take care of my child. And the only thing that I have left that I love, and she was all alone with trying to take care of the child that she has. But in this, she had enough food left for one more meal and no possibility of more. The drought had just taken everything else that she had. So despite her own deprivation, despite her despair, when she, we see that she was more concerned for her son, which any parent would be. You're preparing your last meal. You're caring for your son. She was preparing to feed him one last time before they both died. Job 36, 15 says, He delivereth the poor in his affliction and openeth the ears in oppression. You know, when we go through periods of scarcity, often we are tempted uh, and in temptation, it, it's to doubt God's love and goodness, right? That's typically what happens. We face loneliness, and then we face times of struggling with limited resources in our life. We think, God, do, do you really love me? Are, are you really a good God? We may feel that if he was truly gracious, then we'd have plenty, and that God should be able to be there to take care of us right then and right now. And that's certainly the message of most, most churches today. But we don't measure God's love by material possessions, we measure God's love by his grace that he displayed on the cross. I'm thankful we don't have to measure who he is, the grace and the love that he provides for us by a material worldly possessions. We don't measure it by those things. The cross is the substantiation that God's love will, fail, will never fail to provide everything that he deems necessary in our life. And for this widow woman, it all seemed like it was all ending, that she had nothing left. God was going to provide for her in her deepest time of need, in her loneliness, in her limited resources. But what was the, another burden? As I looked at this passage, I thought of three burdens this widow had. She thought had loneliness. Her loved one has disappeared. Now she has limited resources. She has nothing to eat. But I would say that next burden was love. It's like, how, how do you think love can be a burden? It's impossible to truly love someone without being burdened for them. Right? When you love somebody, you are burdened for that person. And now as I see this widow woman in this position, everyone with a lost family member or a child who's gone away from God knows this burden very well, that I love them so much it hurts my heart when they're hurting and I want to take care of them. And now this widow has such a love for her son that she was in constant burden as she struggled to even keep her child alive. You know, love meant that she cared about someone else more than she cared about herself. And her love was a burden that, was, that, that, that she could never put, put down. She said, I have to do whatever I have to do to take care of my son, and now I'm dying. The one thing that she had left that she wants to provide for, she had burdens. And you know, we didn't talk to many people in, in, in our church today, and as believers today, they have burdens. Struggling, hurting health problems, limited resources, somebody who's, who they love, who's struggling around them that they just want to help. And these are the burdens that she had. But let's look at verse number 15. It says, And when she went and did according to, to the saying of Elijah, she and he and her house did eat many days. So number one, we see the burden of the widow. But number two, let's look at the belief of the widow. The widow was a woman of great faith, obviously, Though she didn't have scripture, she didn't have scripture to follow, she didn't know what the word of God said, she didn't have scripture or the fellowship of other believers around her, she was open to following God's direction. So that if this is what God wants me to do, I'm doing it from a human standpoint. Elijah's request is outrageous. From a human standpoint, you mean this stranger comes up to me and says, hey, give me water. Okay, it's a drought. I don't have a lot of water. I can do that. You need help. Oh, by the way, make me something to eat. Uh, Elijah, I don't, I've just met you, and my child and I are going to eat one more meal and die. And he says, okay, well, before you do that, feed me something. That request seems outrageous in, in a human perspective. 
And to, to ask a grieving mother to take food from the mouth of her starving child and to give it to him instead is shocking. Because you look at that perspective and you're like, no, I can't believe that this woman would even, would, would even make these comments or even agree to doing those things. And yet his request went against all human reason. She did what was, what was requested and what he, what he asked of her because she knew this was of God. So she accepted the fact that she had a role to play in God's plan here. So that I don't understand it, I'm going to follow. You know, people sometimes think that because they have very little, they cannot or should not be involved in giving. We see that this is obviously not the case here. We see that from this widow's example, when we suffer a severe lack, we still must obey when God directs us to make sacrifices for him. But what did the acts of her faith cause? So in this belief of this widow, what, how did she act on her faith? Well, we see it was faith to obey. Because when Elijah asked for a drink, the widow brought it to him. Like I said, we don't know how much water she had. It was probably in short supply because it was a drought uh, and because her food was in short supply. But it's doubtful that she had much water. And then when Elijah asked her to make that food for one last meal for herself and her son, she obeyed the instruction because of her faith. Her response was quite different from what I think was when Martha, who objected when Jesus um, instructed the stone to be rolled away from the tomb of Lazarus' grave. See, when this widow woman said, oh, you want me to do that? Okay, it doesn't make sense. I'll do it. When Martha was requested to take that tomb, the, the stone away from Lazarus' grave, she reasoned that, hey, it's been four days. The guy stinks. Um, he's already decomposing. She was relying on her own reasoning. There are many times when we serve the Lord and live for the Lord, we can't rely on our own reasoning. Amen. She lacked faith. And Jesus' reply was what? John eleven forty. 40, he said, Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? It's like if you were just believe, you'd, you'd, you'd see his glory. The question is, are other people willing to ask you for help? Can they, can, would they be willing to ask us for help? Not because they think we have resources, but do they believe that you'd follow the Lord? Does your faith say yes to people in need? And this widow obviously had that faith. 1 Corinthians 9, or 2 Corinthians 9, 6-8, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully, every man according as he purposeth in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now God, God is pleased when peop, with people who are willing to be givers. God's pleased by that, because that lets him know, okay, I'm following him. I'm being directed by him. Jesus said, even said that this, the, the, the widow who gave the two mites gave more than anyone else, not because the amount of her gift, but because the sacrifice in her spirit that she was willing to make. That this was, this was greater than anything else anybody else ever gave. The question is, can you, do you, can you give sacrificially to something or someone? When grace abounds in your life, you have the ability to do those things. Can you serve others? When you have grace in your life, and it abounds in your life, then you can. God never commands us to do anything he doesn't enable us to do. And this was the fact that the, this widow woman had to come to a conclusion. What God, God was not going to ask her to do something that he wasn't going to give her the ability to do. Instead of sitting back and waiting for other Christians to, make, to have it make sense to you, we need to begin living our life according to the word of God. And there are many times we're like, no, that doesn't make sense. There's a lot of things in our life that doesn't make sense. But we see this woman, she had faith. It was faith to obey. But because she was willing to obey what happened, let's look at verse number 16. It says, And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. So we see there was a burden, she had tons of burdens, all these burdens that was taking place in her life. And it was probably overwhelming. But then we see uh, that the belief of the widow. And then because she believed and followed the Lord, we see number three, the blessings of the widow. 
You know, when a person begins to grow and ex- in grace and exercise their faith, he can prepare to see that God will bless him and meet their needs. In that we obey first and then we're blessed. Typically we want to be blessed and then we'll obey. This widow woman realized, I'm going to obey him and then he's going, it's going to follow a blessing. Most of us, we say, God bless me so then I will obey. We see that that's the, scripturally that's the exact opposite. This widow woman uh, trusted God to keep his promises and he provided miraculously. As Proverbs 3, 34, he says, he giveth grace unto the lowly the world would not have ranked this widow as an important person. The world would have looked at this widow and said, another poor person who couldn't take care of their child. But her her humility and her faith brought her to this level of God's blessings beyond that which most people will never experience. All because she was willing to follow the Lord in her trials and in her struggles. So what were these blessings she received? Well, this grace that she received, it was... Grace replenished her physical needs. This tiny amount of meal and oil that this widow had, a portion only sufficient for one final meal and starving and and dying with her child fed not only two, but three people for many days because she was willing to follow the Lord. God's grace is sufficient. It's greater than your need no matter what it is. And that's the hard part for our grace that God bestows on every one of us. Sometimes we look at his grace as his redeeming grace. Oh, you provided grace at salvation, but I don't get grace for anything else. You know, no matter what our need is, God's grace is more sufficient. And yet many children of God, living without the, they live without this experience of joy in their life, of seeing grace meet their needs. Why? Why not? God gives us the answer. Let's look at Matthew 9, verse 28 and 29. It says, And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yeah, Lord. Then then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. Is there anyone that God cannot help? I mean, obviously, we ask that question. You're like, well, of course not. Of course, God God can help everyone. Is there any problem that's bigger than that which she can overcome? Do you face a challenging that uh, or a challenging need that he can't supply? Of course not. The problem is not his ability to provide. Then that's not the problem. It's our reluctance to believe that he's going to be able to take care of that. Faith is required for grace to supply our needs. There are many things we pray for. And sometimes we don't really believe. We're just kind of praying it because we're like, oh, I feel like I have to pray for it. And then so I pray for it, but not really believing he's actually going to take care of it. Uh, Holly's great aunt, Joyce, um, she was diagnosed a few months ago with, with lung cancer. Never smoked in her life, never had any issues, but she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She went in today for a checkup, or not today, or, or the end of the week, went in for a checkup, got her results back. The cancer is completely gone. It's like, it just disappeared. It's not there anymore. It's gone. It's like, it, it was there. We don't see any trace of it. It just disappeared. Why? We believe God can take care of her. God can meet those needs. God can supply. His grace can supply for our needs. So God, grace replenished her physical need, but also grace relieved her fear here. Grace can relieve our fears, yet fear always remains a, a a constant reality in American society. We live in fear. We worry about everything. That's why worry, worry doesn't fix tomorrow of its problems. It just robs today of its joy. But gra- grace relieves of, of, of our joy and relieves us of our fears, I mean. Yet fear remains a constant reality today. That's why mood-altering drugs and antidepressant drugs are some of the most commonly described, prescribed medications in our country. Why? The Bible tells us that a spirit of fear is not of the Lord. We don't have to live in a spirit of fear. And we see his grace in this widow's life here. Bible tells us that we don't have to live in fear. Often after great victories comes a great trial. And it's always a constant, I have victories and I have trials. And after God miraculously provided for her family's needs, she lost the one thing in the world that she cared most about. What was that? Her son. It's like, you're kidding me. We see a tragic loss, grace relieved her fear. Verse number 17 says, And then it came to pass after these things 
that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me and to call out my call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? You know, the only comfort that this woman had during all those years without her husband was her son. That was the last thing she had. And now it's gone. He was her hope for the future. That was the last thing that he had. He was the one uh, to whom she was dedicating her life to. It's like, I lost my husband. I lost everything. I don't have a way. But if I can just take care of my child, that's all I care about. I need to take care of him now, right now. And now suddenly he's gone. Whatever hope and whatever faith that she had accumulated over or developed during those days, watching that meal be replenished, had all disappeared in a moment. In a moment of anguish. My child's been taken away. Also, you, gotta, you have to notice this. She's blaming Elijah for the death of her son. Now, if it hadn't been for Elijah in God's providence here, her son would have starved to death long, long ago right? But we see here, many people do the same thing. Many people respond to trouble irrationally because we're thinking in our emotion, we're thinking in our fear, and we become irrational in the statements that we make. We say, God, why did you do this? And this widow woman, she begins blaming God or supposing that God is there judging her sins. You took the one thing I cared about. Why are you doing this to me? In her grief, this widow woman responded both ways. While it is true, God does chasten his children, uh, and not, not all, but not all trials are punishment for sin. But we see here, we, we live in a fallen world, and the, the trouble is, is natural and a normal part of life. But now she's blaming God for the one who's even allowed her child to be alive. We don't know. It says many days. Her child would have died long ago. And now, after God has provided, now she loses her son. And now, she, because she loses her son, she turns and looks, looks at, at Elijah and looks at God in essence and says, why would you do this to me? You've never taken care of me. That's hurt. That's fear. She had a tragic loss. But then we see, let's look at verse 19. It said, and he said unto her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched forth him, he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. You know, Elijah's prayer here for this boy, that's a great testimony of, of faith. Why? Because before this point, there is no record of anybody else rising from the dead. This is the first time in Scripture where anyone has been risen from the dead. So Elijah, he, he couldn't have truth, truthfully said, oh yeah, I've seen this done many times. I know I can pray and God, that God would do this. You know, he, he's... He just said, I, I don't have previous examples to bolster of his belief that God was going to answer. He just had faith. Elijah believed that God was able to do whatever was needed to meet the need. So Elijah believed that God was going to answer his prayer. Matthew 21, 22, it says, In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. You know, when we pray in faith, we can have confidence that God's going to answer. The hard part is typically we pray and we don't believe God's going to answer. God's power is not confined to the past and is still very real today. The question is whether we truly believe that God's going to answer our prayers instead of just saying, we go and talk to people and say, well, have you prayed about it? Well, yeah, of course I pray about it. You know, I got all these problems. Of course I pray about it. But we might pray, but we don't believe God's going to actually answer our prayer request. The question is whether we truly believe he's going to answer it. Many people say the words, but they have no confidence that his prayer, that our prayers are going to be answered. 
you know, we see here this tender prayer that's prayed, but then we see because of his prayer, a triumphant resurrection. First Kings 17, verse 22, it says, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said unto Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is, it, is thy mouth, is, in thy mouth is truth. You know, even if you are walking in the valley of the shadow of death, even if we are facing all of these difficulties in our life, there is hope in the grace of God. And we live our life, and we come after trial, after trial, after trial. And maybe it looks as if there's no hope for restoring your marriage. Maybe your child is breaking your heart. Maybe you don't see how things are ever going to change in the situation that you're in. The truth is that nothing is impossible with God, and he gives us grace for those things. You'll, you'll never see more of God's grace than you, when you are willing than, than you will in the difficult and lonely times in your life. When you see the difficult, the lonely trials in your life, you will see more of God's grace in those moments than you will of any other aspect of your life. If you had to ask this widow to reveal her greatest fear, she most certainly would have answered something that something would happen to her son. I mean, that's every parent's fear. When her greatest fear became a reality, what happened? God bestowed abundant grace. You know, we don't have to talk to God into giving us grace. We don't have to come up to God and say, God, please, please, I, I need some help right now. God, he gives us grace because he loves us so much. He's a loving father who wants to give us grace. And through his grace, he meets and supplies our needs. He blesses us in ways that are beyond things that we can even comprehend or imagine. So this testimony of this woman this widow has endured for centuries here. She went through trials, but she followed the Lord and he bestowed grace. And, and we even see that Jesus even mentioned this woman in Luke chapter four. Her life stands as a reminder of the importance of faith and the incredible power of grace over the fears of our lives. And we often live in fear. We have trial after trial after trial. It just keeps piling up more and more and more. And then we are, how do I deal with this by God's grace? God's God, grace takes our burdens and replaces them with God's blessing. We might not understand how that blessing is going to come, but we just have to be willing to comprehend that God is willing to show those blessings. Grace takes our fear and it replenishes it with God's peace. Grace provides the means for us to receive what we need from the Lord in those times of needs. Stop relying on our, on our own strength. That's typically what ends up happening. We rely on our own strength. Stop relying on our own strength and allow God to, God's grace to be made perfect in our weakness. Focus on him in our trials because the truth of the matter is you're not alone in your trials. God will never leave you or forsake you as he says in Hebrews 13, 5. That yeah, we might, have, we might have trials. We might have troubles just like this widow woman she had burdens. We all have burdens. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's limited resources. Maybe it's somebody that we love. But have belief that God's going to be able to provide his grace in those times. And then when we have the belief of this widow that God's going to do it, we then see the blessings. We will not have blessings without that belief. God's grace will replenish our physical needs. It'll also relieve our fear and the, and the issues that we have in our life because God is a God who wants to bestow grace in our life whether it's a tragic loss or whatever uh, the, the, the difficulty is that we're facing. God gives us triumphant grace in our life and our tri trials and difficult times. Let's pray.